All right, so supposedly that is starting and it's doing a transcript, which I told it not to do, but we're going to do that anyway. So <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Bert Harold. I'm a dietitian with Carilion Clinic, and this is kind of the kickoff for 2023 for my series of classes that I do that it sort of really focuses on weight management. Um, I work with patients in an outpatient, outpatient setting in Carilion Clinic. Uh, most of my patients, the vast majority, are for weight management. So, you know, weight loss is what that really means. And I've been doing these classes since about 2018. Um, they used to be most of them, well, all of them were in person until COVID hit. And then we sort of started doing some of the virtual ones. And I'm trying to work back into doing in person again. And it looks like things are moving along in that direction. I have some volunteers that are going to help me this year, it looks like. So that's a very good sign. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. I mean, I, there, there's advantages and disadvantages of the virtual, but I'm sort of getting burned out on virtual. <laughs> I kind of like to have in-person experiences. Uh, the turnout, the interaction, everything is better generally with in-person. Um, but, you know, we'll probably have a mix, probably keep doing some virtuals and in-person both. So um, I've been having some computer glitches today, so I'm hoping this will work. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. And uh, let's go ahead and do that. And I will pull up my PowerPoint. So if you guys can, if someone can just unmute and just let me know if they're seeing a PowerPoint slide now. Yes or no? Anyone seeing a PowerPoint yes. slide? Yes, okay. you can see it. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. And if you could, as a courtesy, please uh, mute. And if anyone's unmuted, please go ahead and mute. Uh, a lot of times there's dogs barking, there's key clicks, there's just a lot of other noises and stuff. So we try to keep that to a minimum. Um, I don't have a wingman here to help me manage this as I talk. So it's kind of tough. Um, I, I do hear something clicking in the background, so I think somebody is still unmuted. So um, hopefully you, you can kind of look at that and take care of that for me. Um, so again, uh, tonight's topic is kind of a few topics. So the launch of the series here, it's I usually do Mediterranean diet. I've been doing that in January for the last few years. Um, and it's really more of a meal pattern. I don't like to use the word diet because diet has a lot of connotations of, you know, restrictions for weight loss and that kind of thing. Mediterranean is really just a type of eating. It can be used for weight loss. It can also be used to reduce risk for heart disease um, and reduce risk for cancers and just as a healthy way to eat. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, tonight. I'm also going to give you an intro to who I am. For those of you who are new to the series, new to me, I'll do a, a little brief intro and a bio of my, my background and, and what I try to bring to the table here for everybody. And we're going to talk about weight loss strategies um, somewhat as well, since this is the first in a series of classes. Um, towards the end, like I say, probably around seven o'clock, I'm going to start cooking a meal here live on my stove. And we'll kind of talk about that before and during and after. And that's kind of a chance for people to chime in, ask questions on anything I talked about, or just even other questions that are nutrition related, weight loss related, that kind of thing. I can't uh, help anyone with their individual medical problems, so I just have to throw that out there. Sometimes I get really complicated kind of personal medical questions. This is definitely not the place for that. <laughs> um, if you do have those kind of concerns, um, I'm going to send you guys out some information at the end of the class via email. It's probably going to come to you next week, and that has my contact information if you want to schedule an appointment. So if you'd like to see me in the clinic, you can. Um, and there's instructions how to do that. So, all righty. So without further ado, uh, this is my tentative schedule for classes this year. There's not a lot on there um, for various reasons. I can't really do a whole lot of these. I, I just, I'm having trouble with support and in, in different avenues, but we may do more than just this set, but this is kind of the outline of the basic set that I want to try to to do this year. So this is the launch today. And then there's a March 30th, there's a May 25th, July, September, October, and there's different topics for each class. Uh, so I usually do physical activity, I do tracking and measuring, I try to walk people through how to use the app because that seems to be a, a big issue for some folks. And 
I think it's kind of good to go through that at least once. And then emotional eating, kind of the mental health aspect of it on in July, portion sizes, food labels. And then October, I like to kind of do the holiday one. I don't really do any for November, December. Usually, traditionally, we just don't get as good a turnout in the holiday period there. So, so my biographic information, I struggled with overweight basically since teenagehood on, uh, off and on, you know, just sort of gaining, losing, gaining, losing. Um, definitely was obese for quite a few years. Um, was a past member of Weight Watchers many times. We have several folks here from a weight loss support group uh, from Weight Watchers. Um, I'm a veteran of that of Weight Watchers from the 90s and sort of early 2000s was probably the last time I went uh, to a meeting. Um, but, uh, you know, I had, had significant weight losses. I kept one of the cards that they give you at the meetings when I, I reached kind of a low weight, and I was really proud of that back in 97 there. Um, but my weight's fluctuated. I've been up as high as about 330 pounds, and then I'd go down. The lowest I've been has been about 205, and uh, I haven't been able to keep that absolute lowest weight, but I have been able to keep it down uh, generally into the 210s to 220 range for the last 10 years. Um, so, um, so yeah, that was the big weight loss I had. The biggest really of my life was about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now, 115 pounds I lost. And that was not through Weight Watchers. That was through just kind of self-monitoring and using apps and things myself. And I had some so-called fat pants, that thing where you put two legs through one leg hole. I have some of those pants and I kept them because it was just such a, a huge, you know, major accomplishment to lose that much weight. So transformational. Uh, I always get asked a lot of times what is a secret or whatever. People think there's a secret, there's a, a stimulant or a supplement or special shake or keto or intermittent fasting or some kind of new mental health therapy or something like that that I did that was really unique. Uh, and there really wasn't and there really isn't for me and really for most people. What it really comes down to, I guess, unfortunately, is incredibly hard work and dedication and just kind of recording and measuring and changing a lot of different aspects to your lifestyle. There's no one thing. There's no one special thing. There's a lot of things. And, you know, unfortunately, if you slip in some of those areas, you can see the regain pretty rapidly. Uh, and you have to kind of just keep these things together as best you can to keep the weight off. And that's kind of why we do these classes, just to kind of motivate people to, to show them that, yeah, you can do this. Um, here's how you do it. Uh, no, we don't try to tell anyone that it's easy, uh, but I do show you that it's possible and and sort of evidence-based strategies how to do it. So a little bit more about me, and then I'll move on to the topics for tonight. One of the things that really helped me out personally is I got very, very physically active. I never used to run, but I became a runner. I really embraced it. After I lost about, I don't know, 60, 70 pounds, I was able to really kind of get into that. Um, never ran before, always hated it when I was a kid, um, really couldn't run at all to speak of. And here I am running half marathons and marathons. And it was just, it was really wild. None of my family could believe I did it. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, um, but I've been running now for really since I had that weight loss, it's been about 10 years now of running. And, um, the other big thing that happened when I had that major weight loss is I actually changed careers. So I used to be an engineer. I used to work for Sprint, a uh, cell phone company. And before that, I, I worked for Verizon for a while. Um, I pursued some advanced education and I kind of decided that uh, I actually really wanted to do this instead. I really enjoyed working with people, thinking about, talking about managing weight, trying to coach people, help people with this, because it, it has so many benefits and you know, seeing people's lives really transform is is really amazing. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of struggles. It's not an easy thing to try to counsel on this for sure, but uh, it's really worth it. You know, in the end, when you can potentially save lives or extend lives, uh, it's it's a big deal. So that's what I that's what I did with my career. I went to Lenore Ryan is where I got uh, my internship, my undergrad. I had to go back and do another undergrad, even though I already had an engineering degree. I had to go to Radford get a <laughs> another degree. Um, and then I landed at Carilion Clinic in 2017. That's when I started uh, with my counseling. So uh, that's kind of a before picture. You know, granted, I'm, you know, however many years now, 13 years older than that now. But uh, 
but I was a bigger guy. And then, you know, three years later there, I'm running the marathon and that's a loss of, you know, 115 pounds right there. It's what it looks like. So, um, with me, granted, I'm six foot four and a half, so I can carry weight better than other folks. Um, so my before and after is not as dramatic as I know some people's are. Some of my patients are much more dramatic. Um, but it was a big deal for me. I got off of blood pressure meds. I got off of cholesterol meds. Just that alone, I mean, these medications always have kind of strange side effects and stuff, and they cost money and everything. And it was just great to not be on anything, you know, really, and, and just be free and clear of all that and just feel so much better. Um, and so, so kind of moving on, I guess, to the topics of tonight, I wanted to give an intro to obesity. I do this every year. I used to do it with every class, but I think I'm not going to do it with every class because it just gets kind of redundant. Uh, <laughs> and uh, now that the videos are really kind of showing up on the YouTube channel more. I would just direct people to look at my older videos on some of these topics. Um, but uh, I think for the first of the year, it's good to kind of go back over this. Um, so obesity is is really thought by most professionals, you know, in the field, by most medical, you know, experts, professionals, practitioners as a disease. That was not always the case. I mean, 2013 is sort of when that declaration really kind of got ironclad. Um, prior to 2013, uh, you know, there was still some of those out there, some practitioners, medical folks that still kind of felt, well, you know, this is just sort of a, a thing with, you know, people making bad choices, uh, you know, people just maybe, maybe there's laziness involved, maybe it's just, it's kind of on you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and as we kind of went forward in time, we realized that this actually has the markings of a disease. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in the next couple of slides. Uh, here's a few other, few groups that kind of endorse that disease declaration, obesity and American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. Um, obesity, really in the clinical world, we usually define it with BMI, body mass index. So what that is, is a ratio of your uh, weight to your height. So you take your weight divided by your height. That's all it is. BMI, body mass index, doesn't have anything to do with bone structure or muscle mass or anything else at all. It's strictly just weight divided by height. But it turns out that that has been a pretty good kind of crude, broad diagnostic tool to kind of help us, you know, highlight uh, individuals and groups that, you know, could improve their health with some fat loss, basically. Um, it's not meant to be an all-inclusive number. I mean, there are individuals who have a BMI of 30 that are not actually really obese. They are just, you know, they have a lot of muscle mass and things like that. Generally, only with bodybuilders or really super fit athletic folks have that. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Um, oops. So a more kind of basic definition of obesity is increased weight at a sufficient level to cause reduced health and longevity. So that's just a very <laughs> basic kind of definition. Um, we don't really have a definition based on body fat percentage yet. I think the tools to measure body fat percentage, they seem to be a little bit, you know, they're not really nailed down that well, or they're not commonly available for most people to use. So, um, but really, I mean, I think a better my, my this is my personal opinion here, not medical science, but I, I my personal opinion is they ought to come up with a definition based on body fat percentage because that's really what we're trying to get out here. It's you know weight is you know is a pretty rough way to get at fat, you know. Um, so basically, uh, this disease can be managed, not cured. That's a key key point, okay. Um, I, I see it with my patients. I see it with other, you know, just people in the community, whatever. There's this idea that if we just kind of tune into our inner whatever, that we can cure this and we can reverse it, the body will naturally lose weight. That is not supported by scientific evidence. And that's really definitely not what I see with my patients, I can tell you. Um, if you do hear those kind of stories, take it for a grain of salt. There's always outliers out there. There's people that maybe have some kind of unusual experience, but that is not the case for most people. And for most people, once they lose weight, you know, their body tries like heck to make them gain it back, myself included. My body still works to make me gain weight back, even at this late date, 10 years later. So 
it's very much a disease that, that can be managed, but there's not a cure. Bariatric surgery is not a cure, even though it is very successful. Um, and it can really help people that need it, but it's not a cure. There's just not a cure out there at this point. So uh, sorry for that <laughs> bad news, but that's really the truth. And I think really it's, I think it's important to just sort of embrace that and, and understand that rather than keep thinking, you know, there's stuff we see on social media, there's stuff friends may say or on the TV or whatever about some new thing that comes along or some new strategy or some new therapy or even, you know, even other things, mental health related. None of these things are cures. They're just not. They're just nothing, unfortunately, and I wish that was different. Um, but we can manage it. It's not hopeless. I don't want to send that message either. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point in time, we don't really know of an, an exact cure for it. Um, so ob overweight and obesity definitions, here's some information on that. So normal weight BMI, again, we, we kind of go off of BMI for all these categories, 18 and a half to 25 is normal, overweight 25 to 29.9, obese is above 30. Uh, obese is really kind of the level that as far as clinical is concerned, that's where we really are more concerned about trying to help people to lose weight. Overweight, there's kind of a gray area there. That BMI for overweight, um, a lot of folks are in that category and they are not actually at risk for any disease processes or anything. You know, they have great cholesterol, great blood pressure, great blood sugars. Those are the things we look at. Um, so just keep that in mind too. If your BMI is 27, you're like, oh my goodness, I got to lose a lot of weight here. And it's like, you, you may not have to really, I mean, it just depends. Everyone's a little different there. Um, there's also definitions for children. I don't really counsel um, pediatrics anymore uh, very much, but um, these are the ranges for that. And it's based on percentiles on the growth curve. So the scope of the problem, basically, you can see it's just ramping up, ramping up. These uh, charts come out every couple of years. Uh, there may be a new one coming up here pretty soon. Uh, I don't know if they've got one for uh, 2018 or 2020 yet, but uh, it's it's still ramping up. And we're pretty, you know we're pretty close to 50%. We're closing in at 50% obesity in the adult population, which is uh, definitely not a good place where we want to be in the country. Uh, this is kind of geographically how it's distributed. This data is all from the CDC. You can look it up as well. Um, it's from what they call the BRFSS um, survey that they kind of do. And this gets updated periodically as well. And you can see kind of the sort of the deep south, Midwest kind of areas seem to have a little bit more prevalence of obesity than when you get to the West Coast and Northeast. Okay, there's there's still somebody I'm hearing that's not muted. I hear a lot of key clicks and there was some mumbling in the background. If you could please just kind of check your device real quick, make sure it's muted. Um, that would really appreciate that, thank you. Um, okay, so healthy weight importance. Why do we wanna lose weight? <laughs> so most of us have a list of reasons. A lot of us have doctors telling us different things about it, but I wanted to just kind of run through some of this. Um, so there's mental health ramifications, obviously physical appearance, physical activity, activities of daily living, all these kind of things. You know, if you're not able to kind of do basic activities of daily living, like shopping, house chores, and driving, that obviously feeds back on the mental health. Um, physical activity gets limited as well as the weight goes up and we get kind of more constrained. Uh, there's a lot of practical reasons, riding on a plane or mass transit, Fitting in a normal size clothing, again, there's more choices and it gets more expensive, as, as I'm sure a lot of us know. Um, big and tall stores aren't usually cheap. Um, and not only that, but I mean, there's medical food costs. So motivations for weight loss, um, there's also health reasons. I see a lot of sleep apnea. Sleep disorders are huge. And a lot of times they can reverse with some even modest weight loss. You don't have to get all the way down to what maybe you were in high school, but you know, five, three to about three to 10% weight loss is considered significant. And a lot of times these sleep disorders like the sleep apnea can improve or even go away with some, you know, a modest weight loss. Um, high blood pressure is associated with obesity and overweight. Type two diabetes oftentimes is, and again, that's something that many times can be greatly improved or even reversed with loss. 
Um, there's various heart issues, coronary heart disease, heart failure, abnormal heart geometries, and atrial fibrillation, which is, you know, kind of unusual heart rhythms. Um, a generalized sort of increased inflammation exists with excess fat. Uh, fat cells themselves tend to kind of create more inflammation in the body. They are endocrine organs, basically, and some of the signaling that goes on with them uh, actually does increase inflammation. And so that can definitely be an issue with orthopedic concerns. You know, you have back pain, knee pain, hip pain. A lot of times those things are worsened quite a bit by extra weight. And a lot of the patients I see, they're coming to me because they need to lose weight in order to even qualify for a certain surgery. And um, I've definitely had more than a couple of folks tell me that after they lost some pretty significant weight that the pain uh, subsided, maybe not completely, but it got much, much better. Um, so that's another major reason. Um, and again, osteoarthritis, that's kind of goes along with the inflammation argument and a lot of the things I just said a minute ago. Uh, cancers, we know that excess fat and obesity is correlated to developing cancer as well. And again, th just three to 10% of weight loss confers significant health benefits. So that's one of the, the I guess, lessons with weight loss researchers that they're trying to communicate to practitioners, and I hear it and I read it in articles, is that, you know, um, we don't, we need to kind of set the bar appropriately because we know this is a hard business. You know, uh, if you can get to the three to 10%, especially the 10%, and that's about all you can do and you're sort of in a maintenance mode for a while, you have to really realize that that that's giving you a lot of these benefits that we just mentioned and reduced your risk. And it's an important thing. And not to feel like a failure if you don't lose, you know, 20, 30 percent or, you know, or just realize that, you know, well, that journey is going to take me a little longer, but I've gotten to the 10 percent. I've gotten I've, I've done this huge monumental thing and that's really helped me. That's kind of the way we have to look at it uh, and, uh, you know, not get so upset if like, you know, well, I wanted to, I see on these ads, you know, this guy lost 80 pounds in two weeks on, you know, I only lost only losing a pound to two pounds a week. <laughs> um, and I've only lost 10 pounds or whatever. Well, if 10 pounds is 10% of what you need to lose, you know, uh, that's actually really good. Uh, you don't, not all of us have to lose 85 pounds, you know? So anyway, that's just some, some things to think about on that. So uh, as I said before, um, fat cells used to be just thought of as sort of this kind of dumpster for energy in the body and nothing more. Um, and I guess in the last 10 to 20 years, science has learned that actually fat cells are a lot more than just a dumping ground for energy. They actually are involved with all these signaling proteins that have been labeled as adipokines. And these signaling proteins, you know, they're kind of shown in this picture here from uh, Dr. Robert Kushner from Northwestern University. He's a big uh, weight loss researcher, uh, medical doctor. Um, and, you know, we have estrogen, leptin, resistin, all these different ones, EGF, IL-6, these long names that are, you know, uh, abbreviated here. Those are these proteins that actually work on various tissues, alter metabolism, and can end up leading towards these disease states. Inflammation, for sure, as I mentioned before, cancers, asthma, arthritis, type 2 diabetes, just all these things that having excess fat, excess adipose tissue, tissue can stimulate. And so that's something to think about if you ever, I don't know if anyone in this audience has heard of health at every size. I talked a little bit about that with the support group and even to my own coworkers at work. Uh, one of their arguments is trying to say that, you know, it's perfectly healthy to have a lot of excess fat and kind of keep that. Um, well, it's, it's really, Science says otherwise, at least the predominant view of science and research is saying otherwise. It's generally not thought to be healthy to have, you know, high levels of excess fat on your body due to all these um, interactions. So it gets even more complicated. <laughs> um, granted, I am not an expert on this particular diagram. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But what I wanted to bring up is just the big kind of big picture points of this. So our appetites and our satiety, kind of our hunger cues, as it were, kind of like our, when people talk about following their natural cues to, you know, when they're full, uh, you'll hear people say, well, if you eat slower, 
you will it gives your body a chance to get the signal that your stomach is full you've had enough well that's true however there's a caveat to that um that's relying on the hypothalamus which is a part of your brain that controls it orchestrates all this it orchestrates this feeling of full or feeling hungry or, or satisfied with meals so what we know is that from research is that when people are obese and they start to try to lose weight you know they lose five pounds ten pounds well they start slowing down they start you know they lose some weight and then it gets harder and harder and pretty soon they can't lose anymore now, a lot of times the weight comes raging back on. Well, why is that? Oh, it's because they don't have enough willpower. No, that's not, that's not the reason. That's generally not the reason. Nobody wants to have this. Everyone wants to be successful. Nobody wants to see the weight come raging back on. And um, the reason is this is directed via hormones that interact with the brain and this hypothalamus. There's gut hormones that are released in the tissue and the gut um, and they've got all these different names, and we're still probably learning about all the different ones, but there's PYY, GLP-1, cholecystokinin, CCK, there's ghrelin, there's OXM. I'm pretty sure there's a, even more alphabet soup of gut hormones. And these tend to signal to the hypothalamus what's going on, and then the hypothalamus decides, you know, well, you know, this guy needs to gain. He's losing weight, so let's pull some levers here and we're going to make him more hungry. So we're going to release some ghrelin. Ghrelin's going to st stimulate hunger, and we're going to want to eat some more, even though we know we're full. We, we know that we've gotten enough to eat, you know, the calorie tracker's telling us, but we're going to gin up the ghrelin, and, and that's going to make us feel more hungry. And just for good measure, we're going to, uh, you know, also uh, limit our ability to feel full. Um, leptin is a key, uh, one of the keys for that. GLP-1 is as well. You know, there's a lot of different hormones that help us feel full and feel, feel satisfied. So, <clears throat> so we have these hormones from the GI tract that come up. They cross this blood-brain barrier there, the BBB. That's that black line that's going across the middle. And they, they go up into the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus makes decisions based on these hormones. And there's this feedback system back and forth. And the hypothalamus can can kind of control, you know, and, and signal uh, various hormones that then make us feel hungry and or satisfied. So um, there's also a part of the brainstem that's involved. That's the DVC. And again, you know, the vagus nerve. There's all kinds of different aspects to this. But the key takeaway is, is not to try to memorize all these acronyms because I definitely don't have them memorized either, and I'm not a researcher. <laughs> but there are researchers in this that do understand this in very great detail. And the key takeaway message is, is that this is a process governed by a hypothalamus in your brain. And so what we kind of would really like to do, I believe, is, is reprogram the hypothalamus to the point where we have a so-called new set point. So when I lose 100 pounds, it's going to say, hey, that's where we need to be. Uh, we need to be down here. I'm not going to make you feel super hungry and crank up the ghrelin and limit the leptin and uh, ignore the GLP-1 or whatever. Uh, I'm going to make these hormones back to baseline. This is your new normal weight. That's what we really want. Right now, we don't have a drug that can do that, really. We have drugs that can kind of, you know, we can release, you know, we can inject ourselves with and I'll talk about this maybe in a minute here, but you know some of the new weight loss drugs um, kind of mimic GLP-1, make us feel more full. So we can inject ourselves with these things and kind of kind of make ourselves feel more full and kind of try to trick it, but it's actually not really reprogramming the hypothalamus. And so once you stop taking those drugs, it kind of tends to bring you back to this thing where, oh wait, you've lost weight, we gotta make you gain it back. So I hope that makes some sense. Um, so again, uh, GLP-1 um, is one of the one of the medications right now. Actually, a lot of the medications right now that are really super exciting and really helping people are these GLP-1 receptor agonists. So um, that's why I kind of wanted to show that previous slide. So this is really sort of mimicking the action of this GLP-1 hormone that comes from your gut. Um, and you can inject yourself with it and sort of get this feeling of satiety. You feel full, basically. It also slows gastric emptying, so it makes the transit of the food kind of a little slower. Um, it seems to do a lot of really beneficial things. It was used a lot with uh, diabetes treatment, 
Um, I'm not able to prescribe these to my patients, just FYI. As a dietitian, we're not given the ability to prescribe medications. So that's definitely something in the doctor's realm. Um, but these are really taking off and they're really showing a lot of success because it helps people feel more full. And that's the key. You know, if you feel full, you're, you're that's that's going to really govern everything you do. I mean, you're, you're just not going to eat. So it's easier to lose weight if you're full, right? So um, some of the drugs that are on the market right now, Trulicity, Ozempic, Wigovi, Sixenda, Victoza, you probably heard some of these. Munjaro seems to be real popular right now. I'm seeing a lot of patients that are getting that. Um, the issue right now seems to be, you know, insurances don't like to cover these and there's there's some of that going on or, you know, maybe there's even a, a lack of being able to get them because they're so popular and, you know, the rich and famous are out there taking them because they want to lose five pounds. You know, they're they're already anemic, you know, anorexic, but they want to lose another five to look better or whatever. And and they're able to get a hold of these drugs and it's kind of making a shortage maybe to some degree. There's a lot of weird things going on, but I mean, eventually that'll settle out. I think these will be more common. Um, so and, and another question may be, I mean, is there a non-medicinal way to kind of get the same benefit from these drugs, from the GLP-1 in your gut that makes you feel full? Um, there is some thought that, I mean, if you can have enough uh, so-called prebiotics and the right kinds, so prebiotic is a fancy word for saying fiber, eat your fruits and vegetables. <laughs> That's basically what that kind of boils down to. There's some research into that. That's what I was kind of referencing here. Um, there's a guy named Dr. Mark Hyman and uh, Muriel Doyle that did a talk about this for um, one of the associations with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. They did a webinar and talked about their research. And basically what it came down to is... Uh, you know, if you if you can have a lot of foods that have certain kinds of fibers in them that you can sort of stimulate more of this GLP-1, which makes us feel full. So the, the fibers that they specifically focused in on are inulin, beta-glucan, anthocyanins, and polyphenols. Um, so again, they had increased satiety, they felt more full, and their glucose tolerance is better. So it's better for diabetes. So um, in order to kind of match what they did with their, uh, they made it into a supplement actually that people would take. In order to match the same effect as their supplement, you'd have to eat two cups blueberries, two cups oatmeal, one and a half cups artichokes every day. <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, you almost could do that. I mean, if you really like oatmeal, I mean, two cups is not that crazy. Uh, blueberries might be a bit of a stretch. Um, two cups is a lot. But I mean, you probably could you know, and if you decided to do that, I don't think it would hurt you. It would just, it might be kind of, you know, kind of tedious, but you might, if you were to do that, if you're just really strict and, and I, I recommend, and that's kind of the topic of tonight is to get plenty of fruits and vegetables in your diet because they do have these effects. They, they do, they can help you feel more full. And um, unfortunately that alone is not enough to kind of quote unquote cure obesity either. It's not going to make some of that signaling problem completely vanish, but it will help. And you got to do everything you can to help with this. So again, a high fiber diet, rich in fruits and vegetables will contain really all these prebiotics and a lot of others too. Um, and can help establish beneficial gut flora. So these are bacteria in your gut. That's what's responsible, and I may have skipped over that, and I know I'm trying to go through a lot of stuff here. I apologize, but the gut bacteria is really why these fibers are so beneficial because these, these fibers feed bacteria in your gut. Those bacteria are then responsible for stimulating this GLP-1 medication, basically, um, that then sort of feeds back to your hypothalamus and says, hey, I'm full. Um, so it all gets back down to kind of eat your fruits and vegetables, high fiber, helps the gut, better gut bacteria, makes you feel full, helps you manage your, your weight a little better. So hope that all makes sense. So finally, with this kind of researchy kind of spin here, um, there's a group called the National Weight Control Registry. If anyone has an interest in these kind of topics, what they do is they research people who have lost weight and kept it off successfully for many, many years. So we all know, you know, people have these schemes, they lose a lot of weight. Well, what happens to them two, three, 10 years down the road? A lot of them gain it all back. Well, this particular group, they did not gain it all back. 
So kind of like folks like myself, you know, not to toot my horn here, but, you know, folks similar to myself that have kept off pretty significant weight losses for many years. You know, what are they doing? What is their what are all their secrets, quote unquote? That's what this was a research effort launched in 1994 by uh, Brown Medical School and University of Colorado to kind of address this. And it's been going ever since. They've tracked over 10,000 people, maintained 30 pounds or more loss for over a year. And uh, some of the key takeaways from all this is 78% eat breakfast every day. So it's that kind of old adage, don't skip breakfast. Uh, 75% weigh themselves at least once a week. So they continue to stay vigilant even after they've lost their weight. 62% really don't watch a lot of TV, you know, less than 10 hours a week. And the, one of the biggest takeaways really from this, I think, continues to be the 90% exercise on average one hour each day. So that that's pretty intense. <laughs> and that's something that I know a lot of folks are not doing and maybe not able to do really to the level they want to. Um, but that has shown up in other research too, kind of around this hour time frame or even a little longer than an hour seems to be a sweet spot for daily sort of physical activity of some sort. You know, it doesn't have to be running or spin class, but it's usually a brisk walk. These people, most of them are walking somewhere. That's why they're getting most of their activity. Um, it's whatever you can do, really. It doesn't have to be walking either, but whatever you're able to do. Um, so, and here's a, a reference to some of that. Um, so weight loss strategies. So here's kind of a series of my classes here. Um, today we're going to talk up, you know, kind of going into the Mediterranean here. I got about 30 minutes and I'm going to start my meal. So, <laughs> um, so we want to kind of move from the research side to kind of, you know, what should I be eating? What is Mediterranean? What is that all about? So I'm going to talk about that some more. Future classes will deal with some of these other topics. So this is really kind of in a nutshell, sort of what Mediterranean is. This is the USDA My Plate. It's very similar to the Mediterranean plan. Mediterranean's got a couple of tweaks that I'll mention here in a minute, but the basic idea is you want lots and lots of fruits and vegetables at every meal. So throughout the course of a day, at least, and I say least because you definitely can do more, two cups fruits, two cups, two and a half cups vegetables per day. Uh, Two and a half cups is kind of getting started. You know, you want to do as much as you can. And when we say vegetables, leave the potatoes out of it. I mean, it's <laughs> and and the beans. I like be beans are super healthy. Potatoes can be kind of healthy ish. They're not the greatest always. But uh, when we say vegetables, mostly what I'm talking about is the non starchy vegetables. So the things that kind of crunch that really don't have much calories, the cucumbers, kale, cauliflower, celery, a lot of the C words, it seems like. Uh, carrots. <laughs> um, those are really, those are your friend. You know, you really want to have those as much as you can. Um, and, you know, for diabetics, they recommend half of your plate is filled with those for every meal. And that's a pretty significant lifestyle change. Most people really are not raised that way or culture doesn't really stress that. So that's a bit of a change. The grains, we want about half of that to be whole grains. So like whole wheat bread, not white fluffy bread. Uh, brown rice instead of white, uh, oats uh, in the meals sometimes or in the in the plans. Protein, you want to do mostly lean proteins. Chicken, turkey, fish are typically pretty lean, you know, do without the skin. Beef and pork are usually a little fattier. Try to limit those. And beans, uh, peas, nuts and seeds are very super healthy forms of protein. And eggs, uh, eggs can be pretty healthy too. Now dairy, three cups a day, uh, that's for calcium and vitamin D primarily. And we can get that through, you know, either cow based milk or, you know, today's world, we have a lot of alternative milks for people who are lactose intolerant, or if you just don't like the taste of milk, you can do soy milk, almond milk, uh, rice milk, oat milk. There's a lot of different ones. There's yogurts are great. Um, so, and, you know, kind of in conjunction with that, um, we want to try to keep our sodium down. A lot of people have high blood pressure. We really don't want excess sodium. Our diet typically has 3,500 or more milligrams per day of sodium, and it's thought to, to we want to try to limit that usually below 2,300. Um, 
saturated fat generally will lead to more uh, heart disease. We want to limit that to less than 22 grams a day. Generally, if you're not eating a lot of, let's say, uh, fatty red meats, you know, like McDonald's burgers, uh, butter, if you stay kind of steer clear of butter and ice cream um, and, you know, some of these kind of foods, if you if you do a lot of excess cheese or excess chocolate, those are really where our saturated fats are coming from primarily. Um, healthy fats are usually going to be the ones like canola oil or olive oil, um, and uh, so even some of the vegetable oils, uh, avocado oil is a good one too. Um, and we want to, on top of all this, we want to try to keep our added sugars down. Added sugars are not the sugars that come in a fruit. These are things in candies and high fructose corn syrup and processed foods, things that come in boxes and cans. A lot of frozen meals have sugars added. Um, we really don't need those in our diet at all, just like we really don't need saturated fat. But these things kind of come along for the ride. So we want to try to minimize those. And that's for your health, really, more so, I would say, than for weight loss. Um, you know, there's arguments about sugars and weight loss, I know. But basically, these are things for your health. You want, you really just don't. You want to keep a lower sodium diet, low saturated fat, low added sugars. That's just a, a good thing to live by. Um, and this goes into more details. I'm not going to dwell on that. We got too much to cover <laughs> tonight. So Mediterranean diet in about 15 minutes. I'm going to go through this uh, approach. So what is the diet? There's different definitions. Basically, it's a diet that they used to eat or still in some sense eat along the Mediterranean Sea. There's 16 countries that border there. The hallmarks of it, again, fruits and vegetables. Uh, they do eat uh, beans, um, bread, uh, cereals, nuts and seeds, and olive oil is the predominant fat. Uh, there's very little red meat in the Mediterranean style of eating here, uh, less than a serving per week. So red meat, again, is generally beef and pork. It could be venison, you know, um, it could be some other things, but generally, you know, that's commonly what we're talking about. Uh, fish, poultry, and dairy in moderate amounts. So fish, typically, you're looking at like, you know, Mediterranean plan is really kind of like three or four days a week of fish. It's pretty predominant, pretty significant, I should say. And then they're getting poultry for other their other meats. And um, they'll have a few eggs per week, maybe not excessive. Um, they do have some wine. I don't really push the wine part. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you can definitely do this without the wine. Uh, the fat can be a little higher than the USDA guidelines that I showed earlier. But again, it's healthy fat. I mean, it's olive oil. Uh, olive oil is not, is actually, olive oil is actually heart protective. It's not bad for your heart. Um, the only issue with olive oil is just, you know, it has calories and it's got high calorie density. So you don't want to be drinking it. Um, but it is, a, it is a good fat when you need fat for something. I'm going to use some tonight, actually. Um, so again, you know, seafood is kind of the big thing. Fish and seafood is is sort of what sets it apart. I'd say that the key things that really make it a little different from the general healthy guidelines from the USDA is the seafood and also, um, uh, what was I going to say? The, the seafood and the olive oil, sorry, just drawing a blank here. Um, I think those two things kind of make it a little different. Uh, olive oil is pretty predominant with that type of uh, lifestyle. And uh, so, so why do we want to do it? Well, research continues to show superior health results of this pattern. So prevention of heart disease, increased lifespan, healthy aging. Um, there is a landmark paper. I'm definitely not going to go into that now um, due to time, but um, I'm going to have uh, links to this in some of the materials that I'll mail out to you guys next week in the email. But there was a study called the Predamid trial, and it was a randomized controlled trial in Spain. And um, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 2013, and they found that uh, Mediterranean diet uh, reduced heart disease risk by 30%, and it was actually even better than kind of the standard USDA diet. Um, so it's been recognized as kind of the number one best diet by U.S. News & World Report. They do these rankings every year. Number one plant-based diet, number one best diets for healthy eating, number one best diet overall. Uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, report that they do, and it, it might be worth checking out if you're interested in those kind of things. There's a lot of different diets on there for different things. Uh, I believe their top diet actually specific for weight loss was the DASH diet. The DASH diet 
is something that's for kind of specifically for hypertension, for high blood pressure. Um, but it's also, again, a, a fruit and vegetables diet. You know, it's it's very sort of not processed and a lot of the same themes as Mediterranean. Um, Mediterranean type diets containing fiber and fruits and vegetables reduce risk of weight gain, overweight and obesity. And, uh, and, uh, and this is from the American Institute of Cancer Research which is a very interesting topic all by itself. And again, don't have a lot of time to cover that, but they do something called a continuous update project report. And they actually study all the literature and research every few years, and they issue new guidelines of what, what's new um, in terms of cancer prevention and risk reduction. And so um, it's a really cool kind of system they have there for doing that to review all the research. And so they found, you know, 17% cancer risk reduction uh, just with whole grains. And I, I like to bring up the whole grains because as a lot of us know, you know, we hear this kind of mantra that, oh, it's uh, uh, carbs are are the problem. They're making us fat. They're bad for us. Uh, it's just sugar, all these kind of, a lot of it's kind of nonsense, unfortunately, that's out there. The whole grains are not the same as, let's say, potato chips or crackers or something. Um, whole grains are are very beneficial for your gut, for your gut flora, for these risk reductions, um, for feeling full, um, it's so many different things. Um, so I just, I like to kind of mention that as well. So um, <clears throat> last but not least with Mediterranean, before we kind of get into our whole cooking segment and wrap everything up, I'm going to go through, I, I kind of put these together last year. I think this is a good set of slides to go through. Um, as kind of what does this look like? What are the components of it? So the vegetables are the most important source of these so-called phenolic compounds in the Mediterranean diet. So this is where a lot of this anti-cancer, antioxidant activity comes from. And the key thing with a lot of this is bright colors or at least different colors. You don't necessarily want to stay with green or stay with purple. You want to have purples, yellows, reds, greens, oranges, whatever. Um, those all have different compounds, different antioxidants. The science doesn't really know right now exactly which combinations of these are best or, you know, is there one particular one we want to put in a pill? Right now, it doesn't look like putting these into a pill really helps you, but somehow getting them from the vegetables is helpful. So we want to just kind of spread it around and, and try to get as many as we can and be as healthy as we can. Um, they also bring with them a lot of fiber, again, if we can remember back to some of those slides before, fiber helps to encourage healthy bacteria in our gut, which can in turn, you know, generate some of these healthy hormones like the GLP-1 that makes us feel more full. So we want the fiber for sure, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, and last but not least, as a dietitian, I mean, aside from weight loss, I mean, there's all these nutrients that they bring, potassium, vitamins, A, C, E, and K, B vitamins, copper, magnesium, I mean, they're just, what can you say? <laughs> they're pretty much, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing all the things that they can do. And it's, it's just too bad that, you know, for in, in a lot of cases, they seem to be out of reach for people. They live in food deserts and they're more expensive in some cases and people are having a hard time getting them, which is a whole nother topic for a different kind of talk. But um, they are associated with lower risks of mortality, um, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, Cancer and obesity. So if there's one takeaway from everything I'm rambling about tonight, um, just try to get more vegetables in your diet. And that's, you know, <laughs> you can't go wrong, really. Um, legumes. This is another big component. So chickpeas, lentils, beans are very common um, with their diet. And we know, again, these are kind of like, you know, we can think of them as vegetables, but they're not non-starchy. These are starchy vegetables. So these have their place and they, they bring protein, which is kind of one of the biggest things, very healthy source of protein, uh, fiber for sure, B vitamins. And again, there's antioxidants and you can see there's some colorful, different colors there. We have different antioxidants in play. Um, so they're associated with lower mortality risk, lower heart disease risk once again. Um, and again, there's benefits on cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, fruits. So again, just, you know, look at the picture. <laughs> it looks like they kind of dialed up the saturation and brought the colors out pretty brilliantly on that, which is fine. I mean, it's it's kind of 
kind of a colorful image, but um, you know, you can see the colors there. Obviously, again, we're going we're to be getting the antioxidants. So uh, common are citrus fruits, berries, figs, grapes, apricots, pe peaches, nectarines, and cantaloupe are very common Mediterranean. Um, and again, these are linked with reduced risks of mortality. I uh, should say heart disease, not heard disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity. And again, vitamin C, we all kind of associate vitamin C with fruits, and we a lot of times will associate potassium with them. Fiber, too, is big, and antioxidants. And nuts. So again, kind of like the legumes, nuts have a lot of protein. The common nuts here uh, for the Mediterranean are going to be pistachios, almonds, peanuts, hazelnuts, and walnuts. I typically have bags or cans or bottles or whatever of peanuts and pistachios in my pantry pretty much at all times. I've just worked them into kind of my regular pattern. They are great as snacks as long as you can limit your portions. They are satisfying. They have a lot of fiber and protein both, which is important. And how's healthy fat too? I mean, they're just kind of a good food. You don't want to get ones that are heavily salted. Try to get lightly salted or even unsalted would be my advice on that. And, you know, like anything, it can get carried away. I mean, if you have a big tub of them and you just go through them all day long, yeah, that's that's not going to be supportive of weight management. <laughs> but generally, a handful of peanuts or pistachios goes a long way, and it really kicks down the appetite, I've found, and it's, it's kind of a great food. Um, so, again, rich source of a lot of different great elements for the diet. So unsaturated fats and antioxidants, vitamin E, B vitamins, fiber, potassium, magnesium, list goes on. So uh, again, risk reduction of all these disease states, once again, it's kind of like ditto points here, right? So, and last but not least, I think this is one of the last, actually, I think we got olive oil still too, whole grains. So the much maligned grain product, bread, put a big slice of bread up there on the screen. So common are rice, oatmeal, popcorn, whole wheat bread, cereals, and pasta. Uh, rich in B vitamins, iron, zinc, manganese, copper, phosphorus, selenium. Again, lowers risk of mortality, heart disease, heart failure, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer, high blood pressure, obesity. So, I mean, look at that. Lowers risk of obesity with whole grains. So that's where we have to be careful when you see a lot of the stuff about sugar or about um, white bread products or potatoes or whatever. Um, whole grains are really a different animal than, you know, Wonder Bread. And we do have to kind of be careful when we shop for breads. They will add sugar to breads, which we really don't need. And a lot of times they are not 100% whole wheat. A lot of times whole wheat is not even the first item on the list of ingredients. Um, you know, um, there are different whole wheat breads out there that are a little better. Generally, they'll say 100% whole wheat on them. You know, not to not to advertise for anybody, but you know, there's a the Dave Killer bread is pretty decent. Usually, that's sold pretty prominently around here. But really, any whole wheat bread, even the store brands or whatever, when it's, if it's 100% whole wheat, that's what you want to shoot for, and you'll get these benefits with it. Of course, like anything, you know, you don't want to sit down and eat a loaf of bread. But a couple slices of bread is really not what's causing the obesity epidemic. That's not, you know, the whole wheat bread is not the culprit. Neither are oats or, you know, when we say pastas, again, we're not, we're talking about you know, hopefully a more whole grain kind of pasta. Um, I'm using some here tonight that's whole grain. It's got, you know, a lot of fiber in it. Um, and that's that's the kind of pastas we want to shoot for. So there's good and bad. You know, there's there's good breads, there's bad breads, there's good fats, there's bad fats. Just try to try to keep that in perspective and don't feel that you have to ban all breads of any kind or all grains of any kind. That's that's really not the message. And you can see if you banned all those, you're actually missing out on a lot of important health benefits down the line. So uh, well, I guess we also got fish and seafood here. Um, so for the Mediterranean plan, uh, a lot of the common fishes, you know, salmon, of course, I think we all know that. Mackerel, uh, sea bass, tuna is big. And then they do oysters, shrimp, octopus, and mussels. Um, we know that they're rich with omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA. And omega-3 fatty acids are commonly known to reduce inflammation. So 
some people will take them as a supplement because they're not really getting them from fish or seafood and and that's probably okay uh but if you can i would try to work in fish and seafood into your diet um so we know that they can lower risk of mortality uh been linked to heart, you know heart disease lowering risk of heart disease heart failure colorectal cancer so typically fish and seafood are, are pretty positive things you know there is uh, there's always a uh, nuance to everything here i mean so with fish the issue sometimes is well there's mercury in the fish and uh tuna you know some tunas if you eat tuna every single day and in a large volume of it yeah that m might not be so great but um generally like salmon and, and some of the other fishes are not as not as high and generally most of them are okay if you just do two or three times a week um you know, I, I don't think any of them at this point are at the level where it's like, you know, it's a danger to you. But, uh, you know, if you're a pregnant woman or something, you probably don't want to eat large and large amounts of tuna every day um, just because of that issue with the contamination. I wish that wasn't the case with our food supply, but, you know, it's kind of what happens. And some of the top feeders like shark and some of the unusual ones like that, swordfish, tilefish, things that we don't normally eat those are definitely a lot higher in, in mercury. So we got to, you know, again, if you're pregnant, you don't want to be eating those. But uh, that's the caveat for the fish and the seafood. For most of us, not really an issue. If you're worried about it or if you just don't like fish and seafood, again, there's supplements. There's also um, uh, flaxseed and flaxseed oil. Ground flaxseed is a great source of omega-3. Uh, and actually, you know, some nuts and seeds are too. They have some omega-3. So... Finally, I think this is the last slide, I hope, because uh, we're running out of time on all, on all the on the lecture part here. So extra virgin olive oil, this is another interesting component of, of this whole situ situation with Mediterranean diet. So it's a key part of the Mediterranean meal pattern. And if you know anyone from that part of the world, and I've had some patients from that part of the world, I mean, they really do use a lot of olive oil. It's It's just kind of every day they're drizzling it on things. And it's a rich source of, um, of monounsaturated fatty acids and ex antioxidants. Um, so the, the type of fat is very healthy, and it's been associated with up to 20 to 40 percent lower increase of heart disease and improvements in uh, inflammation. So that's pretty impressive. It's kind of an interesting topic, I think. Uh, it's been studied a lot, and so we know it's a very healthy oil. And it's not the only healthy oil. Um, you know, like I said, there's avocado oils, another one that's thought to be pretty healthy. Um, the vegetable oils, the ones that are liquid at room temperature, you know, canola oil is thought to be pretty healthy too. When you get into corn oil and, um, you know, some of the other vegetable oils, they're, they're still better than, you know, bacon fat. <laughs> they're better than butter, but they're not as good as olive oil in terms of quality as far as health. And it gets into kind of gets into the weeds with, you know, what type of fatty acids are making up these oils and their their impact on our inflammation and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of, again, <laughs> probably veering off into other topics beyond the scope of tonight. But, um, but suffice it to say, olive oil and most of these vegetable oils are, are pretty good for you. Um, and, I, and I do try to use olive oil. That the, the one caveat with olive oil with cooking is, and you probably know this if you if you've cooked with, cook a lot or if you've cooked with it, is it can burn, and so you have to kind of use lower temperatures with it. It might be better on you know maybe some bread or some salad or something than it is to try to you don't know, really want to deep fry with it too much. Um, so here I got some meal plans. Uh, one of the students that worked with me uh, a year ago or so kind of put this together. Um, you know, just kind of some different ways that you could incorporate Mediterranean into your, your lifestyle. So, you know, breakfast, we may not think of having tomatoes and feta cheese for breakfast or, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe olive oil drizzled on our bread, but but you can do it. You know, instead of using butter, I've sometimes I've used olive oil and it's it's actually pretty delicious. Um, you can just drizzle some olive oil and sprinkle some rosemary on there. And and just as an aside, uh, you can grow rosemary yourself very, very easily. I mean, this thing is like a weed. It'll just grow anywhere, it seems like. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I threw some out in my garden. I've had uh, the last year, and it 
it was it became huge pretty fast and i've had it before years you know for years um but uh you know so so you might just think outside the box ways to incorporate olive oil like that um there's soups there's hummus uh olives of course lots of salad greens whole grain breads yogurts fish uh different types of fish dishes so and this is another uh, uh, handout on that, um, kind of how to structure your day with Mediterranean diet. Um, this one actually came from the internet, and I don't have the web link right in front of me, but uh, I think I may have the link on the notes that I'm gonna email to you guys. Um, this is even another example. This is from the VA website, Veterans Administration. That just gives a real quick sort of overview of what we're talking about. Uh, with the different food groups. And uh, this is a guy, kind of interesting, a dietitian that went over to Mediter the Mediterranean, someone named Bill Bradley. Uh, again, another student that was working with me kind of found him, and it, it's kind of an interesting story there. But uh, he had a weight problem, apparently. He went to the Mediterranean, he worked with a chef there, and he wrote a cookbook based on how they're actually eating in the Mediterranean. Um, and he claims that just by eating this really high fiber, super healthy diet, that it's really helped him keep his weight off. <clears throat> so um, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, maybe something to check out. And again, I've got that link as well in some of the materials. But, you know, there's a picture of kind of where he was. He was on the island of Crete. It's where he hung out. And so he's got some real colorful dishes that he shows from his cookbook there. He's got a, some kind of meal plan, seven day plan. Uh, so that's that's kind of cool to look at. He's got some salmon there and um, I'm not even sure what that one is. A salad it looks like with some red potatoes and green beans with lean pork. So yeah, I mean, there is some red meat creeping in. <laughs> so today's recipe, a very, very simple recipe. This is something anyone can do, something we all do, spaghetti. And I wasn't going to do spaghetti originally, but as it turned out, I was having spaghetti myself this week. And I thought, you know what, why don't I just do spaghetti? Because this is something you can literally throw together. It is very easy. Anyone can do it. It's not even really a recipe. <laughs> it's just a few, you know, basic ideas of what you need to do. Um, and anyone can do it. So this is uh, actually my own quote unquote recipe, but I mean, it's not really much to it. Um, so uh, I combine some olives, some uh, baby Bella chopped mushrooms. I get a sweet onion. So uh, it's generally one sweet onion is what it is. Um, it depends on how much you wanna make. If I make about six servings, which is what this is for, I would use a complete onion. I'd use a complete bell pepper. Um, and here it shows uh, one container, <laughs> green bell pepper. This is this is how my fitness pal lists it. That's why it looks kind of crazy there. But uh, the instructions here are, are basically you combine your bell pepper, your chopped bell pepper, your your chopped onion, your baby bella mushrooms, and uh, about a pound of of your um, meat of choice. Now what I what I use here, uh, I believe was uh, ground chicken right i think so. or ground turkey yeah, i use ground turkey you can use ground chicken or ground turkey the stats are about the same on either one of those get about a pound of it and you just you know heat it on medium heat until it's, it's brown about five or six minutes you add all these items together just saute them and, until they get to the point that you enjoy them generally you know five or six minutes probably depends on the heat of your stove and everything and you know, it's it's all just what you want to do. You know, if you want a little bit of a crunch, maybe you don't cook them as long. Uh, I like to have mine kind of cooked to where they're more soft. Um, and then I would just at the end add the tomatoes, tomato sauce, the the herbs, and the herbs here are really just kind of garlic, thyme, oregano kind of stuff. Uh, I've got this mixture of 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 Italian seasonings that I bought that I just sprinkle on there. It's really kind of just to taste what you what you want to do, you know. I would not put salt on there. I don't use salt, um, so that's something that uh, uh, you know to take note of here. And the sauces I use are no salt added tomato sauce from Hunts, 
Hunts makes a lot of no salt added tomato products. That's always what I go for. So you're nowhere in here you're going to see salt. The salt creeps in with the olives because the olives, the, the black olives have salt in them. Um, but really nothing else here has salt. These are fresh ingredients. The pasta, I mean, I'm looking at it here. It's it's 10 milligrams. I mean, it's zero sodium really with the pasta. So why is it healthy? I mean, uh, some people may think, oh, spaghetti, that's terrible. Well, it's uh, this particular version of spaghetti is 430 calories, which can fit on almost anyone's diet, really. Really, literally anyone's diet, you can fit in 400 calories. Um, it's very decent with sodium, 350 milligrams. That'll help you make the 2,000 milligram per day goal. It's low in saturated fat, you know, two grams, very low. It's high in protein. So we have 30 grams of protein with this. Um, that 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 alone is is pretty stellar. I mean, that's like a protein shake, basically. Um, <clears throat> high fiber, 11 grams of fiber. You're you're almost half your day's worth of fiber there just with this one meal. So that's pretty outstanding, I think. Uh, there's no added sugars with this at all. Uh, you see sugar on the label. That's sugars that are going to be inherent in the actual tomatoes and the bell peppers. That's not added sugar. Uh, we're not, there's no high fructose, anything in this. And then uh, it's high in vitamins A and C. So, you know, A for eyesight, C for immune system, that kind of thing. Um, it's even, you know, it's got a little bit of iron in there too, actually, 34%. So, so it's a pretty good meal. So um, I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to start working on the, that meal. And I'm going to try to switch back over uh, to the presentation or to the, the 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 camera here there we go so my lovely face is back <laughs> and so what i'm going to do is move the camera over towards the stove and we're going to start working on this meal here so bear with the jiggly camera for just a second here and i'm going to aim it down there towards the, the pots and pans so I'm going to babble here for just a little bit more as I get started, and then we can start taking some Q&A. Um, so right here, I've got a bowl, uh, just a pot of water. So I'm going to go ahead and heat this up. I'm going to turn on this burner and start getting the, the water ready. That's for the pasta. This burner goes very quickly, so it's going to boil over here if I'm not careful. And then what I'm going to do over here, this is my pan. I'm going to saute things and cook my meat with so what i'm going to do is run over here to the other side of the kitchen which you can't see i'm going to get my ground turkey all right and this is what i tend to use again i'm not trying to advertise any particular brand there's other brands i'm sure but there's pam olive oil spray mainly because i guess i'm lazy i like the spray uh, the spray allows you to to use very little but you could get, you know, you could pour it out of a, a bottle as well. Um, but this is extra virgin olive oil. So I'll just kind of spray this just enough to kind of give us some lubrication on the pan so the stuff doesn't stick, basically. And then I'm going to go ahead and get this burner going. And we will start with the meat. I've already got this measured out. This is actually, this is half a recipe. This is not the full recipe because, uh, as I said, I've been eating spaghetti all week, so I'm kind of getting a little burned out on it. So <laughs> I didn't want to make a full thing of it again. But when you make, if you made this recipe the way it's written, you're going to have uh, a full pound of meat instead of the half there. I'm just going to wash my hands off real quick. So you may see something boil over as I'm walking away, and that, that just sort of adds to the uh, entertainment value of the, tonight's show. I actually had something burn on me once during one of these classes. All right, so this is starting to bubble a little bit. So what I'm going to do is... Once that starts to boil, I'm going to toss in some pasta. So let me show you the pasta I'm using. Now, again, some of this is, is, is I guess, personal preference, but I'm using this tricolor rotini. Uh, some of you guys may have seen that. 
there's different versions of it out there. The tricolor has some vegetable component in it, so that brings the fiber up to, you know, the higher levels of fiber that we're getting with this meal. You know, um, we get three grams of fiber just with a serving of this, and along with the fiber from the the vegetables and stuff in this sauce I'm gonna make, it really kind of helps. All right, so this is starting to boil. So I've already measured out my pasta for myself tonight. So this is about two ounces of pasta. Now, that's not a lot of pasta. I don't know if you can tell, but it's not even a cup. But that's an appropriate serving. That's going to be about 200 calories of pasta. Um, and so, you know, if you limit your calories with these things, also that helps a lot too. You don't want big mountains of pasta. Um, you know, that gets people into trouble and it gives carbohydrates a bad name and people have these big mounds of pasta. Like, well, I don't know why I'm not losing weight and, you know, I guess I need to stop eating it. Well, you just need to control your portions a little bit better. <laughs> so, you know, everything's within, uh, within reason, you know. So this is starting to brown a little bit here in a minute. I got probably got to turn this burner up a little higher. Again, if you turn it up too high with uh, olive oil, it will start to burn. And you may even see it kind of start to change color here on me. Um, I try not to use really high heat with it. So what, what this is going to be is I'm just going to gradually add things. I've got some uh, chopped vegetables over here. So this is my chopped, this is uh, my baby bella mushrooms, and I've got some uh, red bell pepper. I decided to use instead of green, but you can use green or you can use both, and some onion. And the other thing about this too is um, if you have other peppers you want to use, I've got peppers from my garden from the summer that I froze that I may just, I could just throw in here, just random, like I have banana peppers, I've got some jalapenos, I've got some, uh, what were they, serranos or something, and uh, habaneros, I got all kinds of hot peppers. I gotta be careful though, cause they can get so hot that this thing becomes unedible. But, <laughs> but the point is like, you can throw other stuff in here. I mean, this is not rocket science-y stuff. I mean, just, just have fun with it, throw on different vegetables. Non-starchy vegetables, you really can't go wrong. Peppers, you can't go wrong. I mean, just try different things with it. Don't feel locked into like anything that's real rigid with this, I don't think. Um, things you gotta watch out for, again, how much pasta are you using? You don't wanna be pouring olive oil in there because that's gonna create a lot of calories. You don't wanna put a ton of cheese on this when it's done, that's gonna bring a lot of calories. I mean, things that I think most of us kind of understand, you know, when we're cooking. But, you know, certainly you can add as many peppers as, as you want and you can put in more tomato sauce. You can dial the tomato sauce up or down depending upon your taste. Um, you know, it's really not going to add much. I mean, this this whole can of tomato sauce is like 60 calories. I mean, there's really nothing in nothing much in there to that. So. All righty. So I have talked quite a bit and. Uh, I'd like to turn it over if anyone would like to comment or has any questions or anything like that. Uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, this is Marcia. I just wondered about avocados, the avocado itself. How does that rate with the Mediterranean diet? Can so, yeah, I don't know if avocado, it's interesting. I don't know if avocado is, is specifically sort of called out in the Mediterranean diet, but it is thought to be a very healthy vegetable for sure. It's very healthy oil. Um, and I see more and more like doctors sort of recommending olive oil, or I'm sorry, avocado oils uh, with their patients for cooking and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if there's been as many studies on avocado oil as there is on olive, you know, as far as is it preventative in heart disease and, and stuff like that. I, I meant um, eating eating whole av avocados, not the oil itself, but the fruit avocado or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a definitely a very, I mean, it's got some fiber in it. I don't know that it has a lot of protein. Um, but yeah, there's nothing wrong with eating it. I mean, other than just the calorie content. I don't know off the top of my head how much calories an avocado has in it. But I, have, I have to express I, I don't I don't eat them as much as I maybe I should myself. Um, but uh, there's nothing wrong with incorporating them at all. Um, you just have to kind of watch the calories. The good yeah, thing just, about 
Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was just looking uh, a little over one and a half ounces of avocado, 73 calories. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one and a half ounces. I'm not sure the typical avocado. Uh, small avocado is about half. Uh, medium avocado is about a quarter of that. Okay. I mean, of a, of a one and a half ounces. Just because I weighed it, so I know. Yeah, and the other thing you can do I mean, you got to be careful using Google, but you can Google foods and you can put in USDA on there. So you could say avocado USDA nutrition and it'll pull up the kind of the official USDA food database stats on whatever food it is you're looking at. And so that's actually pretty accurate, too, if you just want a, a basic idea for calorie content or even fiber or other nutrient content on any kind of food. But yeah, I don't think people, I don't think obesity is due to too many avocados. I mean, I, I think that's perfectly healthy to be eating those. Um, I don't personally eat them much, but I don't have anything against them. I do, I do like guacamole and, uh, you know, I'll kind of get that sometimes on, on things, but and guacamole is probably, you know, it depends on how they make that, how healthy that is, but. All right, this is starting to brown a little bit. I think I'm going to go ahead and probably lower this temperature a little bit. And I'm going to put in the vegetable mixture. Get that going. So hopefully the camera sort of picks that up a little bit. So the other thing I like to say as a disclaimer with these cooking things that I do, I am not a chef. <laughs> cooking is not something I do as a passion. Um, I do it to kind of be healthy and sort of, you know, live. Um, so a lot of people have more culinary skill than I do, or they have other techniques they use or whatever, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, the, the main thing to keep in mind is as long as your ingredients are healthy, you know, you can change things around and, and cook them in different ways and make fancy sauces or whatever, but you just got to be aware of what you're doing as far as calorie content, sugar content, saturated fat content. And really, um, you know, there's there's a lot of things you can do with, with healthy meals that taste pretty good um, if you have some creativity and you're good in the kitchen, you know. Um, I just... This is just something I've kind of tweaked for my own taste, what I like. It's easy, it's fast, and that's that's a big part of it for me. If it's easy and fast, it's probably going to be something I'll make again and again uh, versus something that, you know, takes 10 pots and you got to let something sit overnight or whatever. It's like, yeah, I'll probably <laughs> never do that. <laughs> More power to you if that's what you like to do. You know, everyone's different, but uh, most of the patients that I have and people in general, I think they're looking for – you know, simpler things. And it's not everybody. I, I do have one patient I know that, that really loves to cook and, uh, you know, it's great, you know, and uh, every night's a new new thing and, and does a very good job, is very healthy. Uh, and that's fantastic, you know, um, but you don't, you don't have to necessarily have that kind of lifestyle to, to keep your weight off. Uh, two questions. One, it looks like you're simmering the pasta. Is that a better way of doing it than bringing it to a bowl? And secondly, it's clear you're not a, a chef because I, I would get you a spatula or something other than that fork <laughs> to try and do all that stuff with it. <laughs> yeah. Um, th there's nothing special about the, the pasta. It's just on a very low boil. Okay. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but it, it is actually yeah. boiling. Um, yeah, I mean, I've... It's probably not good to use a fork either because it's probably going <laughs> to it's going to take the non-stick off is what happens too with that. So, yeah, I mean, some of the things I do, you may not want to do as far as the technique. So I, that's why I gave that disclaimer because a lot of people come on here like, oh, why are you doing it like that? You know, I would do it this way. And like, well, you're probably right, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, Just messing so, with you a little now bit. He's getting, now he's getting a, a there one spoon. spoon. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got a spoon. So here we Tell go. Them, you don't like I usually the break out the, either. <laughs> the, the spoon comes out eventually because uh, I'm going to put some sauce in here. So it's kind of hard to stir the sauce with a fork. So 
And you can cover this too. I mean, it'd probably cook a little faster if I cover it or I can crank it up. I don't want to crank it up too high though because it tends to, to burn a little bit. So I have but, a uh, question. Um, this is Judith. Uh -huh. um, so recently I do um, spaghetti with um, spaghetti squash. And so recently it's not the same obviously with than like it is with noodles, but recently I was, uh, uh, it was suggested to me to mix regular noodles with the spaghetti squash to give a little bit of the regular texture to it. So in what you're cooking there, um, to make us feel like maybe we're getting more than that little, not even a cup of two ounces of noodles, uh -huh. um, is there another vegetable you would suggest with that meal? So two ounces of noodles is actually 200 calories. So just to, to give you an idea on that. So the 200 calories, a lot of folks can't really do much more than, let's say, 400 calories for a meal, you know, for their calorie level. Um, they might get away with 500. Men can eat a little more. So like, you know, a lot of times I might do 400 calories of noodles for myself. Um, but, you know, 200 calories of noodles means you could still have, let's say, a slice of bread with it with some olive oil on it or something like that. You can still have a side with it or even if you had a banana, you know, or or some other things with it. So that's kind of where that comes from. But I mean, as far as uh, I guess the question as far as like alternatives to using noodles, I guess, was a question. Yes, or, or something that you could mix with it to get that texture or try mm. to get close to that texture where you at least feel like you're getting more, but you're eating really more veggie, veggies. Yeah, I mean, uh, the way I'm kind of doing this sort of, I guess, cheating, because I'm just getting a product where it's already sort of mixed together. So this is the, they've got spinach with it um, and some, actually it's got some additional tomato in it. Um, and you can buy just spinach pasta. Uh, I, I don't know as far as, you know, that goes as far as like alternative pastas or whatever, alternative to having pasta that, that I'm not super up on as far as what, what you might do. I generally just try to get either this tricolor style or I get whole grain, whole wheat pastas is what I t typically would do, uh, rather than trying to find like an analog, which is kind of pasta like, um, and again, there's, there's. Karelian has other classes. There's actually a, you know, cooking classes and there's probably some people that can answer that a little better, um, you know, as far as those kind of questions go. Uh, I am definitely, I'm focused, typically what I focus on is quick, easy, healthy, that'll keep my weight off. And that's, I don't get too fancy. If I want vegetables, I'll typically just microwave some frozen ones up real quick because that's easy. If I want fruits, I got a banana hook here. I've got oranges and stuff. I've got pears. That's that's what I do. <laughs> but what I do may not work for everybody, you know. So, um, you know, you, there there's a lot of recipes online if you're looking for different things. Uh, what I usually refer people to is there's a USDA website. Um, called my plate and there's a thousand recipes on there and they may have things like what you're looking for on there as far as you know maybe some different types of spaghettis different kinds of pasta choices or pasta substitutes you know that would probably be where i would look um, the other places i always talk to with my patients about are the heart association and the diabetes association have good websites with a lot of recipes free recipes So this is uh, this is already looking pretty close to being being there. So I think I'm going to go ahead and add in the rest of it. So this is the no salt added hunts. So again, I feel like I'm using a lot of brand names. It doesn't have to be hunts, <laughs> um, but I get the no salt added diced tomatoes. Put those in there, and for you know this is really probably two servings or three servings instead of you know six because I'm doing about half the recipe, but. One can of diced, and then I usually put in a can of the tomato sauce here. And again, it's no salt added. 
And the interesting thing to me about this, and it, again, it might be how your uh, your sense of taste changes over time. If you're used to eating low salt stuff, I don't know, but I don't feel like this is not, I don't feel like it's missing salt. Like I'm not sitting there like, where's the salt shaker? I need to add salt. Like it, to me, it tastes fine. Like when I have this with the pasta and you know, these olives, I put in some black olives, these do have some salt in them. So you're getting some salt from that. And it, you know, if you look at the stats that I, I put on the, on the recipe, it's like, you know, 500 milligrams when you combine the pasta and the sauce and everything together with your meal, which is actually not bad. I mean, that's, that that's not devoid of salt. So you might think, oh, I'm, you're using no salt added stuff. It's going to taste like crap. It's like, no, it's actually, it's got salt in it. It still has salt. It's just much, much less than what we would typically have. If you're sitting there with a salt shaker, you're probably getting eight or 900 milligrams, a thousand milligrams of sodium, which is not good for people with, you know, edema and heart failure and stuff like that. You don't want to be eating like that. So, and really none of us need to be eating like that, quite frankly, but we've just kind of gotten into those habits. So I am going to, speaking of salt, um, not salt, but I'm going to add some garlic. So I have some garlic powder. This is just really to taste. I'm not going to measure this out super carefully. I mean, it's probably about maybe a half a teaspoon or something. I just kind of sprinkle it in there. And then I put in some of this Italian seasoning mix that I've got, which again, this is basil, oregano, some uh, black pepper, basically some thyme. And I just, I sprinkle this in pretty liberally because I really like that, that Italian flavor a lot. Uh, and so again, there's no calories with this. So you could just dump this to your heart's content, <laughs> however much you want or however little you want. That's the beauty about a lot of these, you know, seasonings and things is they really don't, uh, don't set you back at all. As long as you get, as long, you have to read the label. I mean, as long as you get ones that don't have salt, get ones that, you know, pretty healthy or just get your safest. Actually, if you just get the individual, um, you know, get an individual thing of oregano, get an individual basil instead of a mixture. If you get the mixture, just read the label, make sure it doesn't have a lot of salt in it. Looks delicious. Yeah, it's pretty much ready to go. So usually what I'll do is just sort of, I mean, we can dump the noodles in there too, I guess, and just make it complete there. But uh, so, you know, this this is enough really for probably two or three servings, I guess, uh, at least with the sauce. Now, the noodles is not, is not enough for two or three servings, but the noodles, you know, normally what I do, frankly, is I will make noodles as I go. So I'll have noodles one night, have, you know, a third of the sauce or whatever. Then another night, cook up some more noodles and then have it with the sauce. I don't usually make up all, this, all the noodles all at once. But again, that's probably just kind of preference, whatever you want to do there. So I just kind of let that simmer for a little bit and that's pretty much it. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the, the silent claps. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, 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 again, the focus for me on all this is, this is incredibly easy. I mean, you know, the hardest part is we got to drag ourselves out to the grocery store. We got to buy the bell pepper. We got to buy the onion. Yes. I mean, that does, that takes some initiative, but not that much. The chopping of it, you know, it depends on how good a chopper you are. I think it took me maybe 10, 15 minutes to chop the bell pepper and the onion, if that, maybe 10 minutes, I don't know. Uh, the, the mushrooms are pre-chopped, didn't have to do any chopping there. Um, I mean, that's, I cooked the, the noodles while this was going. So the noodles were done before the sauce was. Um, and that's it. You know, it's to me, it's pretty easy. Uh, I usually work this into the rotation every few weeks or so. I'll have some type of spaghetti meal. And what's interesting to me about it, and again, you know, I don't, if everyone made the spaghetti the same way I did, maybe you'd have the same results. But, you know, it seems like the conventional wisdom is if you eat pasta, eat spaghetti or whatever, you're going to gain weight. Or it's like, oh, this week I had Italian, so I gained weight. Well, I'm not having heavily buttered garlic bread. I'm not having bread sticks with this. You could see the pasta was carefully measured out. It's mostly a lot of vegetables. 
and it tastes really delicious. I mean, I wish you guys could sample it. That's why it's good to have the in-person classes because you could eat this and you see for yourself. It's not like, oh, this is a healthy meal. I'm depriving myself. This tastes like, you know, rabbit food, blah, blah, blah. That's not what this is at all. It's a very good spaghetti. And so I like having it. And when I eat it, I actually lose weight. I seem to lose more weight when I eat this than a lot of other things that I eat. So it's not because it's like pasta, I'm going to gain weight. No. <laughs> uh, you know, it just depends on what kind of pasta it is. It depends on what you're doing. It depends on portions. It, it all It all comes down to portions at the end of the day. But, you know, we have to kind of think a little bit differently as far as like, oh, if it's spaghetti, I'm going to gain weight. No, it's not not automatic that that's the case. If you go to Olive Garden, yeah, you, you probably will. But you got to look at what the Olive Garden is. You know, I mean, they're not they're not in the business of making low fat, low calorie things. They're in the business of this tastes really good. So, <laughs> I mean, I think the breadsticks there, it's been years since I've eaten at an Olive Garden, actually, but. I used to love going there, but now it's like the line is so long to get in there. It's like you feel like you need to get a reservation months in advance or something to get in there. And, and it's like the breadstick alone, I think, is like 150 calories or something. And so, yeah, I just don't even – no point doing that. It's not even that good to, to do that, you know, in my opinion. All righty. Well, that's about it for the class. Do you guys have any other questions before we sort of wrap it up or anything else? No, thank you for your time. Yeah, I'm just moving the camera back here. Well, I appreciate the turnout. Uh, I know some folks had trouble getting the link, I guess, or something like that, but it looks like we had a pretty decent turnout tonight. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to be looking in your email, I'll be sending out, like I said, some, some information from today's class. And if you're interested in future classes, just kind of, uh, monitor the Carilion Clinic website calendar, and that's where all these are always posted. And that's the best way. You have to kind of click around. There's like in the upper left corner, there's a little menu button thing. You click on that and that brings up the calendar and that's where everything is. So. We'll definitely appreciate it. Well, the cooking classes are on the calendar too as well, right? Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's quite a few cooking classes of different types throughout the year. Um, I believe there, well, I don't know. There's probably different groups doing them. Uh, I believe there's a diabetes specific cooking that happens, but there's also just general sort of culinary classes just kind of teaching people how to make different types of meals and stuff i mean generally it's going to be pretty healthy it's not going to be paula dean you know it's gonna, <laughs> you know it's 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 i can pretty be, be pretty confident any of the Carilion classes are going to be pretty healthy meals you know that'll kind of support you for, for weight loss what i do here is kind of just again it, it's i feel like it's almost cooking for dummies it's kind of just like this is really simple stuff that you can do, but it's not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not trying to make it hard. <laughs> like it's not using exotic ingredients or anything like that. Um, or, you know, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different things out there. You can learn different techniques, different types of things. Like I don't go through how to chop vegetables really, or, you know, different kinds of things like that, different techniques in the kitchen. Those are different classes. Well, I found the lead up to your cooking very instructive about how what a plate looks like. And then I took pictures of some of that stuff. So, you know, it was it was very informative and I appreciate you doing it. And your cat photo bombs your your cooking. Oh, um, I know. Yeah, does she does it all tail? the time. <laughs> She's a bobcat style cat that I've never seen one of those kind of cats until I don't know. She came along. There was a a colony of these cats where we used to live in Stanton, and a lot, of, most of them had these little short tails. And so we adopted her because there's just, you know, they were just stray cats basically. And she loves to be on the camera. She loves to meow a lot of times. She's been quiet because I fed her. But <laughs> um, one time I made fish. There was one night I did fish and she was just going crazy. So I actually had to give her some fish like during the class <laughs> to get her to stop. 
<laughs> but uh yeah it's kind of funny somebody actually said once it looked like you had a small dog back there and it's like no it's a cat she's just kind of a little big unfortunately <laughs> gotta put her on our diet now i guess <laughs> but we appreciate you we'll see you saturday okay thanks everyone for showing up and take care okay. thank you bert thank you really good thank you bye bye, bye. I'm just not getting out of here.